Good looking doctor, isn't he? He looks like Diane. Is that what you said? Very, very good. Mm. Turned it up a notch, John. They said they couldn't hear me this morning. And I don't have it in me to talk really loud tonight. Thank you. Hopefully this will be sufficient. If you listen to the text or followed along as uh, Cohen read this evening, Jesus had dined with tax collectors and sinners. By association, in the minds of many, he was guilty. He was with the wrong crowd. But his response to his critics was, they that are whole don't need a doctor, a physician. Sick people go to the doctor. And he had come as the great physician to address the real needs of the people around him and the people of all generations to come. Our bodies are such that there are warning signs when things aren't well. You may have aches and pains. You may be losing weight unintentionally. You may have a fever, maybe a headache, just fatigue, all signs that something isn't right. And what do you do the moment those signs start to develop? You go to the doctor because we really like to take care of our bodies, don't we? Meaning you, not me. I don't worry about it as much as a lot of folks do because it takes more effort than I want to put into it. I honestly am far more concerned with the other aspect of my being than with my physical being. But that's in no way to imply that going to the doctor is wrong. In fact, I read about a woman who was just beside herself, went to her doctor, and she said, Doctor, when I touch my cheek, it hurts. When I touch my side, it hurts. When I touch my knee, it hurts. Something's wrong. The doctor gave her a thorough examination and concluded, Lady, your finger's broken. I thought that was funnier than you did, but that's okay. When I think about this passage in Mark chapter 2, I'm reminded that, in essence, there's a problem that all of us have to deal with that has nothing to do with the body and everything to do with the soul. I mentioned to you this morning, and I've mentioned to you on many other occasions, because it's true that we are unique in God's great creation because there's a part of us clearly that's physical and material, but there's also an element that is spiritual and therefore eternal. And if we gave as much consideration to the spiritual as we did to the physical and the material, it truly would be life-changing. And just as our bodies can show signs of problems, the same is true in relationship to that part of us that is spiritual in nature. And the problem that we're talking about, obviously, is sin. It's a far more serious problem than any that may plague our physical bodies. And I don't mean in any way to make light of those who are dealing with physical illness. I know people right now that are under the gun, so to speak, from a physical perspective, and it's heartbreaking. And we wish, if we could, to just step in and to remedy it, to do something about it, to make it all go away. We can't do that. But honestly, there are worse things than being sick physically. Being sick spiritually is far worse because the consequences are far greater. If you can read the text under the old 
print the problem sin, you know that Romans 3.23 simply reads, All sin and come short of the glory of God. Right now, physically, I don't know that I have any serious issues. I shoveled snow a couple of times last night. I realized this morning when I got up that I had done that, but that's a good thing. I sat around enough this afternoon that I don't even have any aches or pains this evening. But there are times in all of our lives when physical problems develop. And I'm not minimizing or saying ignore them, but I am saying to you that from what I read in Scripture and from the illustration in Mark 2, we really do need to be more concerned about the problem of sin than any of the symptoms that may plague our physical bodies. I operate under the assumption if it doesn't go away in seven days and it doesn't kill me, I'm not going to worry about it. But this is something that I need to really be concerned about because this could cost me my soul. You may recall Jesus in Matthew 10 telling his disciples that they really shouldn't fear what happens to the body. They shouldn't fear what men might do to them. He said, in essence, there's only one thing or one person to fear, and that's God, because God can cast the soul and body into eternal torment, into hell. And that's the one thing we want to avoid at all costs. You see, just as our bodies show signs of illness and disease, our souls can do the same thing, our inner man or spiritual nature. It may be a guilty conscience, we may find it hard to eat or sleep. We may have a bad attitude, a short temper. Anxiety may rule the heart. All of these are signs of spiritual sickness. A real problem that needs to be addressed before it's too late. In Galatians chapter 5, and we just recently in our midweek study dealt with the works of the flesh, in my judgment, Paul was outlining there a representative list of the kinds of things that can plague the soul. Just as there are clear things that can affect the body in a negative way, there are obvious things that can affect us and the inner man in a negative way. The list that he gave there was, uh, as I said, representative, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, burying. You know the list. These are signs of a really serious problem. And we need to come to terms with the fact that we all share that problem. I have met people who have said very simply to me, Preacher, I don't sin. I happen to know better. I don't even need to know them to know that that is not true because all of us stand condemned because of sin. There is no one who does good and does not sin, not one person. And as you know, the only exception to that principle was the Lord himself. All of us are plagued, if I can use the analogy, by the disease of sin that plagues the soul as the diseases of the world plague the body. Now, when I say that, please don't think that I'm trying to excuse sin by calling it a disease. That's not the case at all. I'm simply saying this, this is a good analogy. Jesus actually is using that analogy when he refers to those who are well, not needing a doctor, but those who are ill, and he's equating in his ministry his role to address people whose lives are engulfed by sin under this metaphor of the doctor dealing with disease. So come to terms with the reality of the problem, because whether you know it or not, you have to deal with it. 
I would also tell you that when we talk about this problem, the predicament is not hopeless and we're not helpless. Now, I believe there, there are certain diseases that can't be addressed by doctors in terms of our physical bodies. You know as well as I do that people sometimes have problems that cannot be solved by medicine. The symptoms might be addressed and for a time relieved, but the fact of the matter is there is no cure. But this problem of sin that we have acknowledged tonight, that we all share, can be, has been addressed, and a remedy has been provided that actually works. Our problem is that we want to address sin on our terms, not God's. We think we can deal with it ourselves. And I, I've cited by way of illustration Jeremiah 10, 23. And in a moment, I'll mention a couple of other passages. They're actually identical in the book of Proverbs. In Jeremiah 10, 23, Jeremiah said, It is not in man that walketh, that's the archaic King, King James, to direct his own steps. The point that he's making is that left to our own devices, we're going to be lost. We simply lack the ability to address the one problem that matters most, the problem of sin. Yet, we're unwilling to admit this, speaking in a general sense, which brings me to Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Have you ever been certain about a... a, a course of action or a statement of fact or a memory from the past only to discover later that you were in fact wrong. I hate that. And it happens to me far too often. Think that you're right. Convince that you're right only to have it demonstrated that you're wrong. Well, that's bad in the world in dealing with just the ordinary things of life. It's tragic when we're talking about the salvation of our soul and the remedy for our problem, sin. We had better make sure that we address the problem as God has decreed. You go to a doctor and uh, you relay to him or her the symptoms that you're experiencing. Given the symptoms that you convey, the doctor will order certain tests that can confirm or deny various prognoses. Trying to get at the root cause of your problem so that a remedy can be found that will eliminate the problem. Well, in some cases, that works quite well, but as we've already noted from the physical aspect, there are things that doctors just can't deal with. Let me clue you in. At some point in your life, you will be so old and your body so frail that they can't help, no matter what they do, what tests they run, you just as well face the reality. But if you're a Christian, that's not a problem. If you're not a Christian, that's probably one of the greatest problems you face in old age. Your failure to prepare for the inevitable. What is the prognosis if we don't find a remedy for our problem? Well, let's go to Romans again, chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. Now, is he talking about physical death there? Of course not. He's talking about eternal death, spiritual death resulting in eternal death, directly attributed to one thing, sin plaguing the soul. And if we fail to address it, we will be lost. There are worse things 
than physical death, folks. I realize that we, and I mean we in a generic sense, tend to live our lives thinking that death only happens to other people. You wake up dead in the morning, you'll be the most surprised person. Because we expect it from others, but uh, we just gotta, we're just going to keep motoring on. The reality is that there's nothing we can do to prevent our ultimate exit from the material and physical world into the spiritual. That's the outcome. No matter how many doctors you see, how many tests are run, how much medication you take, ultimately we're all going to die. And I'm not trying to be morbid here. I'm just saying what we all know but refuse to say. But it's a different story when we talk about the problem that really matters. The prognosis for us can be quite good. But we have to take our medicine. The wages of sin, death spiritual and eternal if not addressed but the passage doesn't end there it goes on to say but the gift of God is eternal life eternal life through Jesus Christ his son and our Lord now let's use the analogy or metaphor again of a sick person going to the doctor diagnosing the illness and addressing it with the proper treatment. It may mean surgery, it may mean a certain medication, but there are means that can deal with many infirmities, but not all. But from the spiritual per perspective, the problem that matters most, and again, that problem is sin, has a cure. It works for everyone. It works every time. And it works throughout our lives as people of God. I talked to you about this last Sunday night, and I read, I, I lost track of how many passages that highlighted the role of the blood of Christ in addressing the problem of man. The great physician shed his blood to remedy our plight and free us from the condemnation of sin and deliver us from the consequences of that sin, enabling us to avoid both spiritual and eternal condemnation or death. Ephesians 1.7 emphasizes forgiveness through the blood of Christ. Revelation 1.5 makes the same argument. Peter said, we are not redeemed with corruptible things. Silver and gold can't remedy our plight. Now, you can't deal with your physical problem uh, without a lot of money. And even then, there are no guarantees. Isn't that interesting? You go to the doctor, you shell out big bucks, but they can't make you any real promises. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. But the provision for our real problem of sin works every time, will work for everyone, and continue to work as long as we live. If we meet the condition of 1 John 1, 7 and walk in the light, follow the example of our Lord, he left us an example that we should walk in his steps. The one who did no sin and guile was never found in his mouth has shown us the way. If we walk in that way, we're guaranteed to be delivered from the condemnation of the sin which plagues our soul. But let's go to the medical analogy again. When you go to a doctor any doctor, he diagnoses your condition, he understands the problem, he has a remedy that's available, he gives you a script, encourages you to take it to the pharmacy, have it filled, you take it home, 
put it in the medicine cabinet. Every day when you brush your teeth, you look at it, but it just stays there. Is it going to do you any good? I like the way you never answer. You could go like this. It would be okay. You know as well as I do. It won't do anyone any good. You, you've gone to the doctor. You've figured out what the problem was with the doctor's help. You even have a remedy for it. But if you don't take it, it doesn't work. And that happens a lot, by the way. If you ever read the fine print, or if you ever listen carefully to your doctor, he or she will always tell you, take the entire dosage. But what happens a lot of the time? You take three or four pills and you start feeling better and you put it aside. And then you're mad at the doctor because you don't get over it. Or you don't get over it as quickly as you should. Now, whose fault is that really? Let's just be honest. Not the doctor's. Ours. And what have we just said about our spiritual plight and the problem of sin? There's a remedy. But it won't do anyone any good if, if they don't utilize it. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, it's said of Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, to all them that obey him. Do you know that most of our denominational friends think that obey is one of those bad four-letter words? You suggest to someone that you must obey God to go to heaven, and they will say, no, all you have to do is trust him. We're saved by Christ's mercy. Not by our merit. We're saved by his death, not by our doing. You don't have to do anything to be saved, but trust Jesus and invite him into your heart. And yet you can't find that anywhere in the Bible. You can read it in a lot of religious publications. That's not scripture. You can hearken all the way back to the Reformation and the days of Martin Luther and John Calvin and those who followed after. And you can find that those men, and I have great respect for them, but they were wrong. They were reacting to one extreme, salvation by works alone, by going to the other extreme and arguing that salvation is by faith alone or faith only. And all you have to do is trust. Just invite Jesus into your heart and claim the salvation which he offered. Is that what you take from Hebrews 5, 8 and 9? And what in the world do the words of Jesus really mean if the denominational concept of salvation is true. I would submit to you they mean nothing. Now saying that, some would say that I am denying the importance of faith. Not at all. In no way would I minimize faith, but faith alone, James, the brother of our Lord, declared was dead. And faith that saves is alive. Living, active, obedient. Yes, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24, the American Standard Translation of 1901. He also said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Repentance is an action. That begins in the mind and leads to a transformation of the life. It is a change in thinking that results in a change in doing. Can you be saved without repentance? Not if you believe Jesus. Interestingly, those who argue for faith alone would admit that repentance is necessary. Is that faith alone then? Again, go like this. No. 
That's faith with something else, repentance. So the proponents of salvation by faith alone or faith only don't even believe what they advocate. Jesus promised, whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before the Father, and whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before the Father. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Is that necessary for salvation or not? Is confession a part of our response to Jesus based on his own words? And what about believers who refuse to confess? Or would any? who believed, refused to confess? Well, read John 12, 42. Many believed on Jesus, but would not confess him because they feared the Pharisees and being cast out of the synagogue. So there are folks who believed, but would not confess. Would you proclaim them saved? I certainly wouldn't. I don't think any reasonable person would argue that you can be a true believer and destined for heaven and don't even have the courage of your conviction to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God in your own relationship with Him. That's ludicrous. It was Jesus who said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. That is unassailable proof of what is required if the remedy for our spiritual disease is addressed properly through obedience. You know what they say? Well, to be honest, there are questions about the ending of Mark 9 through the close of chapter 16. So we can't really accept that as being valid. Well, what about Acts 2.38? They ask in verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? And an inspired apostle responded, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying to you tonight and what many in our fellowship have lost sight of is that God has a formula that works, but there are conditions that must be met for the remedy to work. Just like there may be medicines that can address your physical ailments, but they won't do you any good if you don't take them. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Not all that say, I trust you, Jesus. Because as you well know, mouthing words is easy. The validity of the words we speak is in the deeds we do. We have a serious problem. The remedy is the blood of Christ. But the prescription calls for our obedience which leads to the prospect before us. Ignore the problem, like most folks do. You know, sin doesn't even exist in the vocabularies of many people today. They're hard-pressed to point to anything and say, this is sin. For one thing, it inevitably will offend somebody to point sin out, and if there is a sin, that would be it, right? you offend somebody, you're not going to do anything much worse than that. I offend people all the time with the Word of God because our world takes offense at the demands of the gospel. But they're not really offended by what I say. Their problems with God, but as has always been the case, when we don't like the message, it's the messenger we blame. But when we hear and heed the message, the outcome is assured. First John 2.25, this is the promise which he hath promised us, even eternal life. I believe as a Christian that Every faithful child of God ought to be able to affirm unequivocally, I am saved. 
and heaven is my home. Not I will be saved because we can't know what the future holds. I would like to think that there is nothing and no one that would ever cause me to turn away from my Lord and Master. But the moment I think that that couldn't happen, as we noted, I believe, just this past Wednesday night in Bible class, we become most vulnerable to temptation. We can know tonight our state and standing with the Lord and whether tonight heaven or hell is in our future. If we have turned to the great physician, we've acknowledged our problem, sin, accepted the remedy, his blood, taken the medicine through obedience, then our future is bright, glorious, and eternal. But on the other hand, and this is key, if you understand what we've said tonight, and I don't, let me be honest with you, I don't think I have ever said anything from this pulpit that's all that difficult. If it were all that difficult, I wouldn't understand it, just to be frank with you. God's plan is simple, not simplistic, it's just simple. It's not difficult. We can easily understand it. And when we understand it, we have to either accept it or reject it, live in obedience or disobedience, knowing full well that the outcome to our problem is determined by us and us alone. The future is guaranteed. God will honor our choice. Do we choose Jesus and take the medicine? Heaven will be our home. We'll not live sinless lives. Thank God he doesn't demand that. But we can be faithful. We can show up when the doors are open and conditions are such that we can get here. And we can worship faithfully. And we can live for him today. And if tomorrow comes, I can live for him another day. Life is only lived a day at a time. In fact, it's only lived a second at a time. But I can be faithful, and so can you. And we will know our prospects are good. But ignore our problem. Ignore the remedy. Refuse to take the medicine. And the death that awaits is far worse than the physical death that is unavoidable. It is eternal separation from God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the redeemed of all ages in a place of complete and utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place so horrid, so terrible, that it really is indescribable. And it's up to us. We know the problem, we know the remedy, and we choose the outcome. Choose wisely, choose now if you haven't already, as together we stand and sing.